Hello, this is the RPG Crawler back with another product review. And this is one that I have been meaning to do for a considerable time now, but it has taken a while to get to for various scheduling reasons. One of the systems in the lineup of Cepheus Engine products from Stellagama Publishing that I've been covering, Sword of Cepheus, is an adaptation of the Cepheus Engine, initially designed for sci-fi style role-playing, now adapted to a more sword and sorcery fantasy genre. As always, I will be going through the book's overall presentation, give a quick overview of the contents, and then wrap up with my thoughts on the system at the end. Written by Omer Golan Joel, Richard Hazelwood, and Josh Peters, Sword of Cepheus, as I mentioned, is an adaptation of the Cepheus engine to sword and sorcery role-playing, and appears to be meant to evoke an old-school feel. Clocking in at around 140 pages with a full-color front cover and black-and-white interior, it is available as a perfect bound or print-on-demand soft cover, as well as a PDF. The interior is very basic, minimalist two-column format with inline tables varying from single column to full page width as necessary, and occasional inline black-and-white line art in a wide variety of styles. The artwork, while varied and moderately inconsistent, being selected from a variety of stock art sources, at least does a fair job of presenting classic sword and sorcery style inspiration, while being somewhat distinct from the typical OSR fair, which I have covered quite a bit of in the past. The writing is largely free of typos and other such technical errors, and is written in the plain, easily comprehended style that I've come to expect from Stellagama games. It's well organized well-edited, and for easy reference during play, pretty easy to navigate. Optional rules are clearly indicated, and there are well-written examples in certain sections in order to aid in learning the system. Overall, the book is organized into ten rough chapters and two appendices, followed by a series of indices for ease of reference. The contents themselves start with an introduction, go on to examine skills, cover character generation, and then explain the various traits that you can obtain. Equipment is detailed thereafter, followed by general rules for adventuring, then combat. A section on sorcery follows, as this is a fantasy genre game, before the main rules conclude with a bestiary of monsters, then lists of treasure. The two appendices are simply a list of inspirational media and then the legal information covering publishing materials for the system. In more detail, the introduction gives you your basic scene-setting description of what role-playing games are, and more specifically, what the various themes of Sword of Cepheus are, being a sort of gritty, open world with dark and dangerous magic that really defines the sword and sorcery literary genre. The introduction also gives basic background on each of the authors, as well as Stellagama and the Cepheus engine itself. It then goes on to detail the basic game mechanic and the die roll systems, which, being based on the Cepheus engine, boils down to a 2d6 roll versus target numbers. The skills section gives a, a very brief description of each of the relevant skills, as well as giving a basic introduction on the way skills are ranked in the game. The skill list is adapted for more sci-fi oriented skill lists of other Cepheus engine systems, but has additional material suited for fantasy settings. Further, even those skills which are largely the same may take on differing importance, considering that you're much more likely to engage in melee combat or other broadly low-technology acts in this particular game. The chapter also touches on languages known and gives rules for skill advancement over the course of a game. The next section is character generation. In Sword of Cepheus, you have six basic characteristics, strength, dexterity, endurance, intelligence, education, and social standing, as is common with the system that it's based on. Each of these is determined by a roll of two dice, assigned as you wish, with optional rules to mimic the stat generation methods of certain OSR games, including a 3d6 drop the lowest, and then a 2d6 in order option to cover both the high and the low end of those systems, and I can really get behind that. There's some mention of low-level social standing that uh, qualifies a character as part of the aristocracy, as well as suggested titles for those particular elements. And then there is a mention of the universal personality profile and a pseudo-hex system, which 
was common in a bunch of the Stella Gama games, although they have since moved away from it. Still, you can use that to basically detail an entire character in a single line. Going onward, the first step of character generation concludes with the rules on making characteristic throws, as well as a table of difficulty modifiers based on the particular character's characteristics. Step 2 gives rules for background skills based on where a character comes from, while Step 3 is where the character selects a career for what they did prior to adventuring. Similar to other Cepheus engine systems, this involves choosing a career and advancing through that career over several years before mustering out. The list of actual careers follows, with full tables for each one showing what is needed to qualify in a field, survive within it to advance or re-enlist for a second term, and what is given at each ranch you attain. Possible skills can be learned on each term, mustering out benefits for when a character exits the career, and then tables for mishaps and events that can happen while the character was engaged in that career. The careers offered are the Barbarian, Commoner, Noble, Pirate, Priest, Rogue, Sailor, Scholar, Shaman, Soldier, Sorcerer, and then the Vagabond. After the career descriptions, there's a set of life events that can happen during each character's advancement, depending on where they're you know, based on, if it's the wilds, a city, a village, etc. And then there's a list of mustering out benefits that are basically a set of specialized gear that can be earned during certain career choices. Rules for character generation based injury and aging are here as well, based on various events and how long a character pursues a career. And the chapter closes out with a very nice set of detailed characters being generated according to the rules, giving a good guideline on how to follow them step by step. The traits section details various character traits that a character can pick up, either during their careers in the generation section, or after character generation with the expenditure of experience. Traits can cover a lot of ground. Some offer unique abilities similar to class abilities from other systems, some might act more like feats from classic D20 systems, while others are just more generally useful, offering abilities such as the ability to backstab, to enter into a berserker rage, to gather allies or beast friends, certain magical or mystical abilities, even basic profession-focused benefits that just give you a bonus for you know, things that you really should know in that profession. The equipment chapter covers available wealth and gear, but bears more in common with an OSR-style system than a typical Cepheus engine game system. Since Sword of Cepheus is based in a sword and sorcery genre, the tech level for gear is all minimal. There's a gold and silver-style coinage system, which seems cribbed directly from OSR D20 systems, as well as streamlined encumbrance system based on abstract item values versus strength to determine your load. There's rules for living expenses, and then a general list of adventuring gear that might be expected for any sort of basic expedition. Personal armor is noted then, which includes basic rules for how various sorts of armor make noise and impact swimming and other athletic feats. Vehicles and mount description and costs follow this, as well as a table that offers necessary information such as speed, cargo, and what sorts of damage each particular vehicle can sustain. Weapons, although limited to lower technology weapons as expected of a medieval and earlier society, along with the damage and any special aspects that may apply to them are listed next. Ranged weapons are treated much the same way, but also include ammo cost and range. As there is also a section on siege weaponry for when that becomes necessary. Amusingly, there is a section on hirelings and mercenaries, which are treated in a very OSR style, allowing characters to negotiate and attempt to hire various men-at-arms and soldiers to their service. There's an expanded section on retainers or fully-fledged sub-characters that a uh, character can have accompany them on their adventure, as well as your classic guidelines for hiring other specialists. The adventuring chapter covers various considerations that are not part of the usual Cepheus rules and in a large part consist of OSR-style rules adapted to the Cepheus system. While there's no technical alignment system per se, there is the idea of having a lawful, neutral, or chaotic character or monster, probably mostly useful to adapt existing OSR material, but also to educate certain spells and effects. There's NPC reaction roles, then rules for timekeeping and wilderness movement, 
Then rules for getting lost in the wilds, foraging, hunting, food use, that sort of thing. Other general adventuring rules that would come up in an OSR style hex crawl are here as well, such as climbing and the natural result of it, falling. Rules for becoming fatigued and resting. Swimming, dealing with various lighting conditions, breaking through doors, and so forth. There's some examples of diseases and poisons that a character can run into, as well as the effects of various temperatures and fire damage, and an optional hero point system for when Cepheus engine characters might just be a little bit too fragile for a genre-appropriate game. The chapter concludes with a page of material for naval travel. The chapter on combat is very much a product of the Cepheus engine background, offering rules of surprise, initiative, and various sorts of attacks. However, the higher prevalence of hand-to-hand -hand combat, considering the lack of more modern weaponry, puts a premium on these rules. As usual, characters can execute two actions on their turn from a basic menu, and melee attacks are a basic melee role, although there are guidelines for dodging and parrying. Similarly, archery requires an archery roll to hit, with modifiers based on the target's current position. There's a built-in frenzy rule that allows for additional melee attacks once a char character drops a target, again stressing the emphasis on melee that tends to dominate the sword and sorcery genre. Rules for damage and healing are given, with armor reducing damage taken rather than avoiding the actual hit as it might in a d20 game. There is a chance to be knocked to the ground if one takes enough damage during a round, and the minor, serious, and mortal wound system from the Cepheus engine basic system uh, kind of makes its appearance here, making characters susceptible to penalties as damage brings down their main three physical stats, with eventual potential death if they aren't properly tended to after a serious or mortal wound. While minor and serious wounds are easy enough to tend, mortal wounds require a throw to even survive once the character is tended to, and may result in permanent injury. After this, a morale system is given to determine when NPCs might fly, flee or surrender, and there's a detailed example of personal combat, which gives a good walkthrough of use of the rules. The chapter continues with vehicle combat and chases, which uses a maneuvering system to determine who may have advantage on attacks, as well as rules for jousting and skirmishing. All of this is followed by an example of mounted combat, and then rules for attacking and damaging vehicles, such as ships, wagons, and so forth, as well as repairing them. They uh, use a sort of system similar to an abstracted starship and vehicle combat system from Cepheus Deluxe, just reduced to account for the fact that, as a sword and sorcery fight, it usually doesn't involve spaceships. The chapter does close out with an example of naval combat, which is helpful since those rules generally don't come up a lot and you may want something very clear in terms of determining how you're going to handle them. The sorcery rules are somewhat more interesting. There's some guidelines on initial starting spells and how to read and sense magic, but after the casting, it's just not considered an automatic event in this system. Rather, you may, must make a sorcery check to even cast a spell. Further, general casting takes a very long time under normal circumstances, about 10 minutes, so the only way to really have spells go off in the brief combat round is to charge them into a focus beforehand. This uncertainty in casting, combined with long casting times, does help to limit the uh, use of magic in a way that's very different from memorization and spell slots. There's rules for learning more spells and concentrating on existing effects, but there's also mention that spells can actually critically fail, potentially triggering a mishap. This mishap table lists a number of potential accidents, a number of which are potentially fatal, or can produce long-lasting mutations due to exposure to the strange arcane energies that power spells. There are rules on talisman and foci, talismans being used to assist with spellcasting, while focuses generally of allow a spell to be cast more swiftly. The various shades of white, gray, and black magic are touched on, with black magic tending to be more offensive and having more of a corrupting effect, even when simply learning them. This can trigger corruption effects, which can effectively mutate the character or produce unnatural effects around them. There are optional rules for producing minor magical tricks, and hastily casting spells uh, offer an increased failure rate in order to get them off faster before a general example of spell casting is given. The actual spell tables follow, and there are basically six levels or circles of spells divided into white, gray, and black magic with six of each of those for each level. 
The spells are then described in turn, with each spell having a circle, range, duration, and description of what they do. As for the spells themselves, some of them are new, but a large number of them are either dira adapted directly from some variation of OSR-style systems, or are clearly meant to be simply as the same spell split into like two or three versions. Uh, there are a large number of them that have had their mechanics and ranges adapted to the Cepheus engine, which is good because uh, it does it does differ in that regard. You can't simply just copy-paste a number of these spells over. Although some of them are simple enough in their effect that you, you really can. Now, while some may consider this a cheap way out, I do like it since it can allow for easier translation of existing OSR adventures and material, but I will have more to comment on it later on. The chapter on monsters starts with a list of the various monster types, and again, there's a lot of influence from existing D20 systems, with types such as beasts, constructs, outsiders, undead, and such. It should be noted that at least beasts have various subtypes that describe various types of carnivores, herbivores, and the like, and some consideration is given for the fact that monsters and creatures may have instincts rather than education, and pack organization and structure rather than actual social status. The monster entries that follow have a very similar format with size, type, terrain movement, UPP code, number appearing, treasure type, as well as a list of skills, general behavior, attacks, armor and movement speed, general alignment according to the law neutral chaos axis, and morale. Each creature also has a very brief description that may go into any special rules that are required for it. The monsters themselves are, well, again, they're mostly D20 and OSR staples converted to Cepheus engine stats. There are a few creatures that are new, but by and large, they're things that you can see in generally any old-school D&D clone. The exceptions that could be noted are the various demons are more random and some of them are more classical, what you might expect of a darker, more traditional sword and sorcery style setting. The uh, treasure chapter starts off not with actual treasure, but with rules for magical research, offering ways for sorcerer style characters to create new spells, as well as rules for identifying magic items themselves, which I suppose makes sense. Then there's the set of rules for creating magic items and potions, which while brief, still offer more of a guideline than I see in some more typical OSR systems. The rules for generating treasure hoards then follow with tables to create treasure based on type. The type in this case is the general size of the treasure rather than like an actual like numerical or, or alphabet type. They are ranged from a proper like full-on hoard all the way down to just incidental stuff that you might find in someone's pocket. A potion table follows, as well as tables for other magic items, such as rings, weapons, armor, and so forth. I know I've said this many times so far, but here again, many of the magic items are either directly taken from classic D&D clones and OSR systems, or adapted when a direct translation really wouldn't be possible. These various items are just generally given a few lines in a table for their description, rather than a full-on paragraph or whatever. The book then concludes with Appendix A, which gives a list of games, books, and other media to use as inspiration, and Appendix B that gives the various legal information, and indeed confirms the fact that a fair amount of these items and the like were borrowed from OSR games, before finally concluding with a decently detailed index. So, Sword of Cepheus. What do I think about it? You know, I've covered other Stellagama offerings and had some hesitation since they were usually sci-fi or similarly modern settings, whereas I'm really, and this is a fault of mine, I'm primarily a fantasy sword and sorcery guy. This does mean, however, that this one is right up my wheelhouse. So first, in terms of presentation, it gets the job done. It's easily read and referenced formatting and writing. It's got a lack of general major editing errors. And it's got a minimalistic design style that makes for something that can be quickly referenced during character creation and during play. I have always enjoyed the fact that Stella Gama puts rather lengthy examples of most of their critical rules and systems in the game in their main books. 
And I really wish more RPG systems did such a thorough job of it. This particular version of the Cepheus engine makes for swift play that evokes the obvious OSR influences throughout the rest of the book. In essence, this is a core OSR experience with the, D10, D, the D20 engine kind of pulled out and replaced by the Cepheus engine. That in turn, however, does raise three primary issues, and they may or may not actually be issues for your group. I will admit, I'm about to go into nitpick mode here. The first issue is that Cepheus engine characters are, on average, more fragile than your typical modern D&D characters. This is less noticeable when comparing them with older edition style clones. However, the general power scale is on par with certain literary sword and sorcery sources over tabletop games. Not all of them, mind you, but a fair number of them. Now, the ample number of optional rules to make characters more or less survivable and generally scale their power throughout the Sword of Cepheus book does go a long way towards allowing you to customize your particular campaign's general survivability and power scale. But it should be noted that if you're trying to adapt existing OSR content or come up with a campaign based on one literary character over another, say Howard versus Lieber, You'll need to take a thorough, long look through the rules to identify what tweaks you want to make to mimic the experience. Sword of Cepheus gives you the tools, but you will absolutely need to use them to adapt it to your particular game. The second issue is that Sword of Cepheus, in its equipment, spells, monsters, and treasure, does take such a heavy amount of material from classic OSR systems. On the one hand, this is good. It makes for a high degree of familiarity for players who have played those systems before it allows you to convert older material to play with a Cepheus engine if you prefer this rule set, and it gives a known starting point to develop your own material, so you can use that as a base for scaling and estimated abilities if you're more familiar with D20 systems and you're just getting into the Cepheus system. On the other hand, this may feel like it's just rehashing the same material that so many D20 retro clones have in effect already done. So it may feel it cheapens the system as a whole, that it, you know, should stand on its own. I personally don't see this as a problem per se, but I understand how some might. And the final issue is the magic system, which I like. It has that chance of failure and long casting time that both evoke the classics of literary sword and sorcery, while balancing out spell casting in a very non-Vancian way. This reliance on talisman and foci to enhance or speed spell casting the existence of mutations and corruption all make for a very interesting system that departs from D20 style OSR and gives a more unique experience, one that's somewhat reminiscent of Conan systems that I've read in the past. And then it almost immediately brings in so many spells that are just direct copies or conversions of old D&D spells. This can be somewhat forgiven by the fact that some of the spells, especially older ones, are so very generic but it does echo the issue I just raised in that the OSR elements, while familiar and quite frankly welcome from my point of view personally, can still seem to countermand some of the more interesting and unique qualities of Sword and Cepheus that are set to you know, make it stand out. And I can see how many people may have more of an issue with that than I do. That having been said, Sword and Cepheus can be a very good way to ease a group that is just used to playing D&D or similar derived systems into a Cepheus 2D6 system if they haven't played it before. I do like the fact that it has so much classic material in it, but it is also a great system standalone, and if it did not have all the OSR-based material, it really would feel like a unique offering. Fortunately, most of the aforementioned baggage just deals with treasure, monsters, and other fluff. With a bit of effort, someone who wanted to run a truly unique sword and sorcery genre game could readily change up the spells and design their own unique magic items and creatures and just plug them into the existing rules and system, and you would probably never really know that it was so OSR-based, at least in terms of the fluff, because the core system itself is so different. And at the end of the day, honestly, that's really the best way to run any system. I mostly recommend Sword of Cepheus, very specifically for groups that already enjoy either the Cepheus engine, but are looking to some play something a little bit more classic fantasy, or for groups that enjoy D&D, but are looking to change things up and maybe get into another system without necessarily abandoning the genre they've become comfortable with. However, it does make for a nice break from yet another D20 Blaze Retro clone, and can do well for any group looking for a new system to play the genre with. And on that note, 
I'm going to wrap things up here. This has been the RPG Crawler with my look at Sword of Cepheus. As always, I will put a link to where you can pick it up below. If you like what you've seen, remember to leave a like, comment, got any feedback, and subscribe for more RPG content, both tabletop and computer. Until next time, take care and goodbye. And if you are still watching, I would like to take the opportunity to thank my supporters, the top tiers of which are listed on the screen, without whose support I would not have been able to offer the variety of content that I have on this channel throughout the years. If you're feeling particularly generous and would like to join them, you can support the channel. There are a variety of options to do so. I have a Patreon, a Subscribestar, as well as channel memberships enabled. If you are not in a position to contribute, simply leaving a like, a comment, or sharing my videos are all wonderful ways to help the channel grow without spending a dime and are all greatly appreciated.